Talk and Rock Radio, where friends meet at the intersection of life, inspiration, and music. Here's your host, Rick Kern. Welcome to Talk and Rock Radio. My guest today is one of the performers that you just saw on the video. He's an original member, lead guitarist and vocalist, and still performing with them today. Welcome, my brother from a different mother, <laughs> Jules Alexander of the Association. Hey, buddy, how's it going, hey, man? Great. How are you doing, man? Uh, doing fantastic. Excellent. Just to, just to give everybody a little bit of background, um, about where you're originally from you were you were born and we're in chattanooga tennessee right yeah yeah and of course you lived out in los angeles for a while and uh and now you you call wimberley texas your home which yes, is yes i do it's a great great little place we love wimberley <laughs> yeah it's a little tourist town sort of you know <laughs> what originally took you out to la jules my mom uh, divorced very early, and she remarried a fellow who lived in Pomona, actually. It was just, just a little outside of L.A., and uh, we moved there in, when I was in the seventh grade, I guess it was. Yeah, seven. And uh, we were there through uh, ju my junior high school, and I got into high school and did not like it. So I quit and joined the Navy <laughs> with a buddy of mine. Yeah, I under, that's, I, that's what got me there. I understand. Now, of course, I said in the opening of this intro that, you know, we're, we're like brothers from a different mother. In <laughs> fact, you're the one that, that said that the other day. And, and our likes are so similar. You know, we have <laughs> parallel uh, music histories. We both performed our live music out in L.A. We both love photography. Uh, we both like beer. Uh, yes. <laughs> we, we both live in Texas, uh, yeah. and we both look very similar up on the top here. So, you know, 
<laughs> hey, it's all, it's all good, man. <laughs> yeah. 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 So let's, let's talk first about how you, um, how you originally got into music. Well, uh, I got into music from, uh, actually it was a friend of my mother who they worked together and uh, they were good pals. And uh, uh, Jean McCollum was her name. She's long gone. But uh, she had a guitar with about three strings on it and she gave it to me. And so I figured out where to get strings and put had her put the other three strings on and that was it. She showed me a G chord, a C chord, and a D chord. And I invented an E minor chord. And, <laughs> and I thought I had gone to heaven when I found an E minor chord. And uh, so I started playing and singing. I was uh, in the eighth grade at the time, something like that. I think I think my very first exposure to playing guitar was also a G chord, and it was uh, <laughs> "You Are My Sunshine." <laughs> oh wow! Well, with a G, C, and a D, you can play a thousand songs. So, it's, oh boy, you know exactly, yeah. exactly. Well, you um, the other you know we've had numerous fun conversations already, and I <laughs> I, I know the other um, one of the first ones we were talking about astrology and we talked about astronomy we you know we talked all yeah. about um numerous things you know but oh, yeah we both have the love for photography talk a little bit about how you got involved with photography and of course i think uh right out of your what college first college gig or something you were working at a uh what at an observatory or something well it, it goes back farther than that my mom uh when she was divorced uh, we lived with uh, like a, a walton's type of family my grandparents my mom her two brothers and and uh more or less more of an urban environment chattanooga which is i say is the smallest big city in tennessee we lived there and she worked at a photo retouching place uh olin mills what it was and at the time there was no no uh no Im computer uh, kind of programs to work, you know, this is all film, right? And they would have lines of people, women working on these, uh, working on the negatives and retouching them all, cleaning them up, you know, making sure everything was, and she was one of the photo retouchers. And she would work by herself also at home. She had an easel. And some of my earliest memories were her with her easel working on uh, negatives and prints. So I got into photography right there, you know, as a two or three years old, I just, I was around photographers and her and sort of got, really got into that sort of thing. So it was brand new. I mean, I was when I very young, I even won a photography contract, well, number two, place number two, when I was nine years old, a contest, you know, of a black and white thing, but I've been into it for a long time. So well, that's how I got into that. And that led into astronomy, strangely enough. We had moved to this house uh, in East Ridge, Tennessee, which is right next to Chattanooga. Just, and and uh, there was woods all around. I mean, it was pretty rural. It was gorgeous and wonderful. And I was out in the woods one day, 12 years old, and this kid came up to me. He was out in the woods also. He's about three, four years older. And we just said, yeah, this woods, cool, play. Let's do this. And uh, he said, hey. I've got a big telescope in my backyard. You want to go look tonight at the moon and everything? Oh, yeah, sure. And so I asked my mom, and yeah, he just lived up the street from me. So he sure enough had a nice telescope. And he said, the thing is, I'm involved with the observatory here in Chattanooga. In Chattanooga, there is an, an observatory which was started out as a research facility, but the, the, the city grew up around it, and it could no longer compete with the city lights. So the owner gave it to the college there and they used it as a teaching tool. And this friend of mine, Bobby Thompson, was like the golden boy of the, uh, the astronomical society there, the club, right? Because he was really, and still is, really smart guy, knew, knew as much as most of the people there. And so he had the keys to the observatory, ha, ha, ha. And he was old enough to drive. So we spent all summers at the observatory uh it was open on a friday night and the public would come in and we'd show them around and 
So I really got into it hard. And, and there was a, a wonderful dark room there. It had a big camera on the telescope. This uh, the 20 inch uh, cassock rain telescope, which was uh, pretty big at the time. That was 1956, 57 roundabouts in there. So we, we had the run of the whole place. So I got involved in astronomy, photography, uh, and then <laughs> her mom gave my mom gave me uh, uh, the, the guitar. So guitar, telescope, uh, photography, all at the same time in Tennessee. And that's how I got into that stuff. Wow. Now, did you ever, in, in when you were working with your SLR for the first time, did you ever do any Cibachrome? Did you ever do any Cibachrome kind of stuff? Yeah, actually, I, I got into uh, alternative ways of, of processing film. And uh, I did, I, I never did Cibachrome, but I did a number of things. I ended up with my favorite project, which was processing black and white film and coffee you can you can do this incredible stuff if you if you uh develop the film using coffee and it's it's jokingly referred to as what is it caffe all <laughs> for and what it is it's a dye it dyes the film as opposed to doing heavy duty chemical stuff and uh it makes very interesting shots man like I a mean, like a is it like a sepia or what is it what it's, is yeah it? it's a, it's a it's slightly colored you know because of course of the the coffee color but it it's very it has a very wide range so you can get a lot of uh, detail down in the whites and the blacks and you can get cloud formations and see all kinds of you know stuff yeah. in them and uh, it's it's amazing so well this photo right up here the orange and the yellow and black and all that you're seeing, mm -hmm. that's Cibachrome. Ah. I shot that photo in 1975, 76, something like that. That's Marco Island, Florida. Oh, yeah. I know Marco Island. Yeah. And it's uh, oh, just a, a beautiful place. Our band, yeah. our band played there, and uh, we just absolutely fell in love with it. And, I mean, the hotel was right on the ocean and uh, ah. just a great place. But that photo was taken right after a big uh, afternoon shower, and, uh, and wow. that's not touched up. That's exactly what it looked like as the sun was going down, those big cloud plumes. They looked like bombs had just gone off, like oh, atom man. bombs or something really really cool yeah. colors and stuff and uh absolutely loved it and and then of course i got into from the regular slr nikon system that i had i finally mm -hmm. eventually got into uh you know dslr you know mm -hmm. and then and then our son i think my love for talk you know for photography uh kind of passed on to and my wife as well loved photography it kind of passed to our kids because they both love photography. In fact, our son's a photographer for Getty Images, and uh, he's shot probably close to 80,000 photos for them now, or probably even more. I don't know. But but anyway, yeah, we all love photography. And then uh, as of late, I have really enjoyed um, photo micrography. And, uh, wow. Okay. In, in, in fact, uh, as you recall, uh, when you and I spoke, I think the first time, the same day you and I had both seen the face of an ant. Yes, it was on the internet. I, I'd seen it. You had mentioned it. And I just said, oh my, I know what you're talking about. It looks like the denizen from hell. I mean, good God. I know, man. You know, now we know when we get bit by an ant, why it hurts so bad. Yeah. <laughs> he not only has sharp teeth, but he's got an ugly face that goes yeah. with it. You my can see he's God. mad. <laughs> that is just, you know, so anyway, so by this time I've already showed the photo and uh, so happy <laughs> Halloween, everybody. Yeah, right. Because <laughs> tomorrow is Halloween and, uh, you know, so there you go. You know, by the time this show airs, Halloween would have passed. But yeah, anyway, that's all right. <laughs> Let's talk about the association, man. You know, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. this uh, one of my most favorite groups growing up in, in early you know my early drumming career which started when i was 11 years old and i'm i'm, I'm going to be 73 here not too long so that tells you how long i've been at it but i tell you what the the association was one of my most favorite groups of the 60s i mean there were a bunch of them but between oh, yeah. 
between you guys and Vanilla Fudge and, and uh, oh man, the Cow Sills. There were so many great bands, you know, and, and uh, I mean, we grew up loving your music and still do. It's timeless, you know. Oh, thank um, you. Talk a little bit about how the association came about and, and uh, you know, and take it from there. Okay, well, it's a long story. So I'll begin with uh, Hawaii. Uh, I was in the Navy uh, and I joined out of high school and uh, I was at Pearl Harbor, a station there. And I was at a party and I was playing guitar. It's when I was just first learning and folk music was really happening at the time, you know, and had this folk music and this guy had a recorder, you know, a little, little, he was sitting over there and I was playing something and he started playing along and it was like, holy smoke, man, we, we played and it was like, we knew each other already. And it was Terry Kirkman. Uh, so Terry and I, he was working at the, over in Hawaii he was a, somebody had hired him to go as so it was oh cool you know and so we we got together there and uh all of a sudden he disappeared after about three weeks and what happened he said he decided he was not going to work for more business for him selling business uh papers <laughs> so he quit and he went back he did suddenly went back uh to California where he was from okay uh, you know, I thought, well, okay, you know, well, time went on, time went on. Uh, I got out, I was out of the Navy. Uh, my, well, it's several things that happened in between. Family had moved to California. Uh, I had moved to California, uh, got in the Navy in high school out of then. And so I went back after I got out of the Navy. Uh, I was in Pomona, California, where I lived. And uh, folk music, as I said, was happening. I'd gotten fairly decent on the guitar and I got back to Pomona and my mom said, there's this, this folk club I've heard about. I said, okay. So I, I went to it one night. I walked in the door, looked over. There's Terry Kirkman standing in the corner, laughing, talk to a bunch of people. I thought, oh my God, he was managing the place. So it was just, it was kind of amazing. So Terry and I got together. And he would play recorder, and we started uh, going to jams, which were called at the time were called hoot nannies, and uh, every every folk club, which there were a lot of them all over the place. There were like coffee houses, folk clubs. Uh, Terry and I would go play play at them, and uh, he knew some people over in L.A., which was about thirty miles away. I mean, from from Pomona. And so we started hanging out in L.A. and got into the L.A. folk scene at uh, the clubs there, which was the Ice House, the Troubadour, McCabe's, uh, on and on and on. There were many there, so we would be playing around, met a lot of people, got my first actual gig uh, playing guitar behind a duo of two, two young women, uh, Jackie and Gail, who had been in the Christie Minstrels, and they quit. And they were putting together uh, their own act and uh, started playing. And that was at the Troubadour. That was all this whole Troubadour crowd was was there. All the, the Troubadour was basically the heart chakra of the folk music in, in L.A. And it was just a happening place. We would play there a lot. And uh, what happened is how this band started, Doug Weston, who owned the Troubadour, did not like the Christy Minstrels who were in this other club that was down the road about a mile away. And he decided he was going to put together a band that would, would challenge the Christy Minstrels. So he said, okay, we're going to have uh, some auditions. So one weekend there was auditions all week, weekend long. And there was a lot of people that went on to start other bands, myself, Terry and, and uh, 11 others. Yeah, there was 13 of us who was selected to be in the group, and we started the group called The Men, okay? And it was, what happened is we were folk music, and I think myself and Harvey Gerst, one of the guys, wanted to say, look, we play electric, how about let's just, let's just throw some electric guitars in there. And Ted Blueshell, one of the guys who's a guitar player, said, you know, I'm a drummer. I said, what? I said, yeah, I was a first chair drummer in college. 
And then one of the other guys said, I play bass, you know. So we put together this band. We had a drummer, two basses, uh, uh, one, one or two, we had two electric guitars. And the rest of the, uh, by, it, it, all the other guys had uh, acoustic guitars. So we put together a band called it The Men. And it was hot. I mean, uh, we got a real good reputation. Everybody was pretty good, you know, good singers, pretty good players. So we, we did well, you know. And uh, we were, and Doug Weston, it was his, his deal, right? Well, it didn't work out. He was their manager. The management didn't work out because he was a little crazy. <laughs> And uh, he, he was let go. And another fellow came, saw, had seen us. Terry had met this other guy and was telling him about our troubles. His name was Dean Fredericks, who was an actor. He was Steve Canyon in the, there was a series called Steve Canyon, and he was Steve Canyon. And he was an up and coming young actor. And he said, well, how about I manage you? And we said, okay. So <laughs> he started managing us and he knew a lot about acting and how to present oneself so we went from this band that was putting trying to put ourselves together we got some good professional advice about how to how to do it you know and we got better and better and better and he was with us until along came mary came out we found that song the way we found it as i was doing starting being a studio guitar player and uh, uh, i went to this session and they said, okay, we're just doing this a little, we'll do a demo, a song demo, which is what happens when you either write a song or play somebody's new song and then make a demo record of it. It's just a basic record. Here's the chords and here's the melody. And I played the guitar on it and I played it and I heard it and I said, listen, guys, we got this band. Uh, I want the song. And they said, okay. So they gave me permission to do the song with the band. And I took it to our band, which was the men that had broken up and formed a second band of six people, which was more contemporary because folk music was, uh, it was on its way out, you know, and we wanted to get more contemporary being folk rock. And we were advertised as the first folk rock chorus and orchestra, the men. Uh, well, that was the men. And then it went to the association. We formed that. We got that song. And uh, along comes Mary. We put it out. You know, we went to Valiant Records. We, well, we, we auditioned for every record company in town. And nobody knew what we were because there was no folk rock at the time. It didn't exist. And uh, they didn't know how to, how to market it, anything. So we went to Valiant Records. Valiant said, well, we don't know what you are either, but we like it. So <laughs> let's do it. So Valiant put it out and bingo, it was a hit. And we were on the road. That was it. That's how, that's, I know that's kind of a strange way to put it, but that's, that's the way it happened. And what's interesting too, is that you had some members in that group that were members of the Christie Minstrels. Yeah, that came later. That came yeah. later. And I and I kind of you know as I did the the historical research on this and everything that that was very very interesting that yeah you had that kind of some of that crossover from that group into yeah. your group and yeah, uh, yeah that that's, that's terrific. Um, along comes Mary, great song. Uh, yeah, in it fact, was musically really interesting. That's one of the things that got me. It it had chord progressions that I hadn't heard yet. You know. Sweet as the punch. When big desire is the fire in the eyes of chicks who say 
On the Ed Sullivan Show in 1969, you guys performed one of your own personal compositions called Dubuque Blues. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. What was the inspiration of that song? Ah, it was that song came about. Well, I was writing songs, as <laughs> sort of, and uh, we were on our very first tour, very first national tour, and it was the first break of our first tour that we've been driving <laughs> three station wagons for, for a, num- a lot of weeks. And we had a couple of days off finally in Dubuque, Iowa. And uh, it was a good time to write a song. And that's, that's later on, it came, it came from that stay in Dubuque, which was nothing, nothing really weird happened there, but we played there and uh, it was dry city, except for on the other side of the, the, the Mississippi River, it was wet. And it was just one of those things. And uh, the way it, that song came about, which was later on during that tour, we had another stop in New York City. We were staying in New York City. And uh, I was writing and I just had the idea, the, the idea of the song came about. And uh, it, it was written in New York about Iowa. So <laughs> 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 It's half between New York and California. There is a highway in and back, plus an active railroad track. And the west side of the city sells no liquor. And I can't recall the instances that keep it in my thoughts. City parks and nighttime girls are ancient lines no
One of my most favorite songs uh, that you all did was Never My Love. And yeah. uh, talk about that one a little bit. <laughs> okay. We were uh, cutting. We had done our first album and our second album. Second album didn't sell well, or at least it wasn't promoted very well. Anyway, uh, we were getting material for a third album. And uh, the, we had, Valiant had sold our contract to Warner Brothers, okay? And Warner Brothers were finding music for us. You know, when we decided to, to do a recording project, we said, look, we write songs, but everybody else writes songs too. Let's just take what, what we can get, you know? And we said, find us some songs. We're going to put our songs on it. We want other songs. So the record company got these two guys, the Adrisi brothers, to come, come show us some of our songs. We were all living in this house, most of us. There was a rock and roll house uh, on Ardmore Street in LA, a big, big old 1920s large house. And uh, it's where we rehearsed and did, did just everything. So they, he sent the Dreesey brothers over to show us their song. So we get a knock on the door. We open the door and here's these two guys sitting on the porch back to back to each other like this with playing with their their guitars like uh like uh, oh you know oars and they slid into the house and said we got some song for you we said okay we'll take them <laughs> i mean these guys were they were these crazy guys they were really funny you know they're funny bunch of guys anyway so that's how we got the song and they played it you know and went okay <laughs> so, now for all of you youngsters here's one of the top rock groups of the World, the Association. You ask me if there come a time when I grow tired of you to 
There was a <laughs> there was a period um, where you left the association briefly and uh, and had an LA group and in fact the photo that that you sent me of Bijou was that taken in front of that house you were talking about a little while ago no, the night that that was later on this was a while a while later on and that was actually uh, uh, Alex Alex's house uh, Alex and Joan those are two sisters by the way Alex and Joan yeah although you would never tell by looking at him because Joan's dark and dark long hair Alex is blonde and light and you know fairy like but it, it, but that was her house she looks like Michelle Phillips from mamas yeah. and the papas yeah 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 real cute um well okay so this group called Bijou that you were yeah. a member of for a while they there was eight members in the group and uh Talk about that group. I think it was only seven. I'm not sure. Let's see. Well, I counted uh, the names. Two, there was eight. Three, four, five, six, seven. Yeah, it probably was. <laughs> I don't remember. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, we had we had put together a group. I was out of the band, and we were going to put to, we put together a group, and we were rehearsing. And uh, Alex, in fact, was a boyfriend. Was one of the guys who knew one of the guys at A and M Records. So what we what happened is. A&M has a nice facility in LA. I don't know if you're familiar with it, but they've got a couple of recording studios, a couple of rehearsal halls. And they said, listen, you guys want to rehearse? I mean, we're kind of interested in you. Come down and rehearse, you know? So we went down to uh, their thing and they really liked it. And so they paid for a couple of tunes to be recorded. Well, in the end, we found out that they didn't like us that much. Actually, we look kind of like the SLA, you know, when it was happening. In fact, that was one of the guys said, you guys don't look like a band. You look like the Symbionese Liberation Army. You know, <laughs> well, I mean, we had a black guy in the band, all the women and one Italian guy and, and me and Russ. And, and uh, so they dropped us and it just, they dropped us and a number of other bands at the same time. I don't know what was going on or that, but. But that's what happened. So they, they booted us and we said, okay, we're just not going to do it anymore. And I started another band uh, called Joshua Fox. And that lasted an even shorter time. But what I found out that I was trying to do the association again. You know, I mean, we, we had a, we, they even did a record, a record with Tetragrammaton which was a uh, Bill Cosby's record album, record company. Woo -wee. Uh, and, uh, and it went, it came, it came out, but Cosby had no idea how to run a record company. So it didn't do anything. <laughs> and I was trying to do the association said, I, I said, what the hell am I doing? You know? <laughs> and so I, I went back to the guys and said, okay, I'm ready to come back. If you're ready to have me, what had happened is they had hired, uh, Larry Ramos from the Christie minstrels to replace me. And Larry is really good. He's a good player, good singer. And uh, they said, well, let's just make it a seven-man band. How about that? I said, yeah, sounds good. So, so we were then a seven-man band, you know, and uh, that's how that happened. Now, uh, yeah. in the group Bijou, mm -hmm. you did a song called Granddad. Yeah. Talk, talk about it. That's one you wrote. Oh, yeah. I've, I've written a number of, of tunes about my upbringing in Tennessee and so on and so forth. And that one's about my granddad. My granddaddy got a redneck soul Got a redneck heart, a redneck gold Eyes that shine like a southern
you know, and that's what it is. Yeah, it's it's a nice little song. Yeah, I Thank really you. really like it. Yeah, one of your very biggest hits, "Cherish." In fact, when I po started posting up on my site that I was going to be doing this interview with you, uh, I had a gal uh, ask me, "She said, is that the same group that did the song Cherish?" And I said, "Yeah." And so, uh, <laughs> so anyway, uh, that performance of of you all doing that at the Coconut Grove along with the windy that I played at the very beginning. Uh, what a great little room that was out in California. Oh, yeah. 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 But, uh, but talk about Cherish, man. I, I love that song. Well, that was Terry, Terry Kirkman and the band wrote it, and I arranged the vocals in it and a little bit of the shape of the song. Uh, uh, Terry, had, it took him a long time to write it. I mean, months. I don't know why it happened, you know, but... Uh, he did it, and we'll find, that's that's about it. There's all there is to it. He wanted to write the song. He wrote the song. It took him a long time. We did it, and the record company didn't even um, the publishing company didn't want it. You know, uh, it, we were published with still our the old stuff published with Beachwood Music, uh, which is Capitol Records mu uh, music publishing company, and uh, the. The guy who was the head publisher said, oh, come on, you're using the word cherish. That's not even in the English lexicon anymore. Nobody uses that word. And Terry said, he gave him the finger, you know, and said, no, we're doing it, you know, tough, you know. And so we did it. And <laughs> well, we know what happened, you know. <laughs>
Bless you all. Thank you. All right, let's do this more often. Now that he, I, Terry is responsible for getting that word back into the English lexicon because it's uh, now I hear it all the time. It, it, it actually wasn't heard very much in the 60s, you know, but uh, that's the story on Axon. Is that one of your platinum records back there on your wall, Cherish? Yeah, yeah, that's that's one of them. Yeah, nice. That's the platinum and the gold. That's a, I got a couple more, but. They're around somewhere. <laughs> what What's the other one back there that I can see right now? Besides, oh, that's your... the uh, the gold one for uh, 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 the next the next album, <laughs> whatever that was. I have to look at it and see. <laughs> <laughs> you have so many, so who's counting, right? You know. Well, I got <laughs> about four, maybe <laughs> four or five, something like that. You had talked earlier about while you were in the Navy out in out in Hawaii and, mm -hmm. and meeting meeting Terry and everything. Mm -hmm. And I, I know he's he's a, a super talent when it comes to writing. He, he wrote a song called Requiem of the Masses. Uh, talk it's about that one. Yeah, it's Requiem for the Masses. Or for the Masses, yes. yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, he worked a long time on that one, too. I know he worked, you know, months, perhaps, on it. It was during the Vietnam War. And uh, it was it quite, it was a protest song, absolute strong, strong protest song. And uh, uh, record company didn't want to do it again. And we said, no, we're doing it. Here it is. It's the B-side of Never My Love, by the way. And they, so anyway, uh, Jim and I basically, Jim Yester in the band, uh, and I basically did the arrangements, gems and mine. I, I modified a couple of things in it a lot, uh, but that was uh, that's what it was. Jim Jim had a cat. He went to a, oh I think he was going to be a Catholic priest once, and he went to the the seminary school and so on and so forth like that. So he really knew that kind of music, you know, and uh, he knew the arrangements on that. So that's that's really arranged as a as a, a requiem. The sounds you are hearing are not the sounds, the sort of sounds you expect to hear from a pop group. But the young men of the association are tremendously talented, and tonight we ask them to perform one of their own compositions. It is a moving tribute to those who die without knowing why. And they call it Requiem for the Masses. Turn your eyes. 
eyes to the bloodshot sky Your flag is flying full At half past for the matadors Who turn their backs to please the crowd Figures that recorded him Black and white was the newsprint he was mentioned in Black and white was the question that so bothered him He never asked, he was taught not to ask What was on his lips as they buried him I got a, a friend uh, request from Jim yesterday. Ah, uh-huh, great! Yeah, yeah. Oh, and, uh, darn. and and Jerry also his brother. Yeah. Oh boy, you talk about genius. Whew. So you you must have told them about us doing this show or something. I told Jim about it. Yeah, and cool. I guess Jim told Jerry. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. Nice. Um, really, really cool. Of course, you did that song on the uh, on the Smothers Brothers TV show. Yeah. And. Uh, really really powerful i uh when i first saw that i thought wow this is cool and of course i'm watching the drummer anyway man he's got good, <laughs> great technique you know yeah yeah ted blue shell that was either uh ted was on the uh record uh just wow fantastic drummer yeah really really nice now i know that was a protest song but how how well was that received by the excellent. public in general? Yeah, excellent. It was received very well. A lot of people who were in Vietnam had got a hold of us and and said thanks. You know, they said that uh, we we heard we hear you. You know, and it sort of helped it make them through the night there. You know, this is the part of the interview, Jules, that I want to ask you to uh, to share with you some. Uh, interesting stories that that you that you have uh that you've experienced in you know it can be about when you're in the association or or tv experiences anything that you'd like to talk about tv huh well i'll tell you my favorite tv show we ever did was uh, uh were you living in la by the way i lived in la from 73 till oh let's see 78 Okay, you probably remember Tom Snyder then. I very had, well, very okay. well. Okay, he had a, a late night TV show for a while, and we did his show, and that was my favorite show of all to do because when what happened is when we did that show, uh, uh, Larry's brother was also in the band, Del Ramos. He was our sound man. Okay, and he was the genius sound man. And uh, we went up to the studio. Okay, at the time, they had their own sound production company, and they were gonna, we were gonna do it live, and they, they wanted to do it to be the the engineers. And we said, wait a minute. I said, look, there's that three inch speaker that you're gonna go through, which at the time that's all a TV had in it. It's these terrible speakers. <laughs> and and I said, we spent a lot of money and time recording it. Let us let us do it. Let our sound guy be the engineer and snyder said okay 
you know, it sounds good. So we've never done it before, but why not, you know? And sure enough, it sounded great. I mean, uh, uh, Dell Dell did such a fantastic job on it. So that was that was my most fun experience I think I ever had. I mean, you know, we did the the big ones. The his show just came and went. It was too bad because he was a really good good interviewer. But uh, we did the uh, the Ed Sullivan show about two or three times. I don't know something like that. And uh, just a whole bunch of Mandy Williams and the Smothers Brothers. and all the, It's what you did if you were having hit records. All the bands did the same sort of thing. Uh, and they were great to do. I mean, really great to do. But, but that one, the old <laughs> Tom Snyder show, was a, that was the top. You know? Now, Del Ramos is a neighbor of yours, isn't he? Doesn't he live over there by you somewhere? No, no. Uh, Dell lives in Las Vegas. Uh, oh, Las we, Vegas. Oh, who, yeah. who is it that's living near in, in, near Wimberley or whatever we were talking uh, about? Yeah, that is is Paul Wilson. What huh. happened? Yeah, what happened was we do a tour generally every summer. Maybe sometime they'll. It's called a Happy Together tour, and it's about six bands, and they'll switch out bands sometime. It's not all us or all you know. It's it's a it's done with uh, the Turtles and, uh, oh gosh, the Cow Sills, uh, the Buckinghams, the Box Tops. Vogues, uh, the Vogues. Yeah, the Vogues do it. The, uh, the Vogues do it. Uh, 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 Blowing Eddie. Yeah, yeah that's yeah. them and the Turtles. Yeah, well, uh, uh, Eddie can't do it anymore. He's gotten too ill to do it, but Mark yeah. Bowman still does it. And and uh, Ron okay. Dante does that part anymore. And Ron Dante is uh, is the Archies. Okay. Yeah, the Ar <laughs> the Archies, and then you've got the Buckinghams also. Yeah, yeah, the Bucks and and uh, oh gosh, uh, Three Dog Night guys. Yeah. Uh, uh, Chuck, and, and Chuck son, Negron. Yeah. Yeah, Chuck. He's a what a sweetheart he is. Well, you're going to uh, connect me with him, man. You got you got to make that happen, man. Okay, I'll do that. I'll We've been talking. I I did reach out to Amy, his wife, and everything, yeah. but but uh, I I I've just got to get him on my. He's on my bucket list. I really got to talk with Chuck. That'll be oh, fun. He, he, yeah. Okay, I'll definitely get a hold of him and, and uh, say, do it, do it, yes. do it. <laughs> he's got his own podcast, but oh, but boy. that's all. But that's all right. You know, I yeah, I, that's cool. I, I I love doing you know. Uh, cross podcasting and stuff i've done that with several people and they're they're a lot of fun to do and i can help promote his and he can promote mine and all yeah, of that. They, that's that's good i just watched there's a couple of uh engineering recording engineering podcasts that are out there in fact a lot of them that are doing that and they help each other uh, in fact you find out about the other ones and you go oh let's let's listen to all of these you know so yeah. well and it helps the analytics and everything too you know I'm, I'm really growing this thing but i mean when i did my one with the I don't know if it was with it, Gary. I think it was with Gary Puckett. And uh -huh. then right after that, when I did one with Carl Giamarisi, oh, man, yeah. my, my numbers started skyrocketing, man. I mean, they've just grown and grown and grown on my subscribership. So, right. so when I do those kind of shows and, and this one will be included, I'm sure there's going to be oh, a lot of people that are going to want to watch this because I'm putting a lot of the, your great music in there with it and everything too. Cool. Plus, cool. Plus, it's just fun to see your smiling face, man. You know, <laughs> it's nice to see your face too. <laughs> I know we kind of look alike, but you know, well, we're brothers from the same mother. So, yeah. Well, we are. Different we are. You know. S speaking speaking of beer that we both like, and of course, I haven't been drinking <laughs> a lot. Be, you know, with with the COVID and everything, I've kind of pulled yeah. back on my wine and beer. But uh, have you tried any of the Goose Island products? Uh, I think so. I think so. Out of yeah, New York, they're out of New York. And uh, uh, really, uh, it's really good stuff, you know. It, yeah, you know, around here, uh, beer making has become a, 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 there are like four craft beers right within 10 miles of, of our house. You know, I've had the, the best porter I've ever had anywhere, anytime, right, just right up the street, Middleton Brewery, you know, it's just really good. Uh, it, it, a few things like that, you know, and uh, I'm really enjoying it, you know. In your wineries too, man. There's a winery yeah. there. There's a winery there in your town that yes, we went to, and and it seems like it's kind of up on a hill and looking yeah, down. Yeah. 
it's really very oh, charming. Man. We had a, a good time there, you know. I'll be darn. Tasting tasting their stuff, you know. That it was great. Our kids live in Austin, so that's that was just a fun <laughs> side trip that we took, you know. Oh yeah. yeah. There's a bunch of little towns like that over there, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, God, I can't even. They're all, you know. Uh, oh, they're San Marcos, New dripping, Braunfels, dripping, 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 dripping springs. springs. <laughs> In fact, a dear friend of mine, Angelo Amoriello, uh, he left El Paso and moved to uh, San Marcos. He he lives in a little community called Kissing Tree. Yeah, and, I know uh, where that is. I know yeah, exactly where that and, is. And they've yeah. got a they've got a little outdoor thing there called the the mix. It's part of their huh. community, and and they always have, especially on the weekends, bands performing. Uh, Angelo called me yesterday. He's a drummer, a singing drummer. In fact, I managed their band a little bit here in El Paso when they were here, but they've been gone for, oh, I guess a couple of years now. Uh, they relocated to San Marcos, and they just love it. And uh, their kids live in, one of their kids lives in, uh, I think, Dripping Springs, mm -hmm. and the other one's up in Colorado. But I think they might be moving back down uh, to to their uh, to their area you know so they'll have all these kids there but it's really um it's really a neat community and they've got i think who is it not not uh uh one of the big one of the white hat cow you know country singers oh, trying to think yeah, it's yeah. not garth brooks it's um the other one <laughs> the other guy anyway i can't yeah, think of him right now but anyway his keyboard player lives in in the kissing tree there. And so Angelo's gotten to know him very well. And they even got, he got him tickets to go to Las Vegas and see them perform there and got them back backstage and, you know, got press, you know, got passes and everything for him. So, yeah, it's been a really neat thing. They, uh, yeah, he's, he's got that TV show. I know, I know who you're talking about, you know, here, in this part of Texas, there are so many bands. You throw a stick and you're going to hit a guitar and put it out of tune. I mean, it's ridiculous how many bands there are around here, and they're all good. I mean, I, I, I don't even the bad ones are good. You know, I mean, it's there's there's live music all over this part of Central Texas, and uh, it's really nice. It's really fun. So there's, yeah, there's a lot of a lot of good bands there. I mean, you know, and mm -hmm. uh, like our son. Uh, he shoots for Getty, and so he's always doing things with Willie, and and just a mm -hmm. lot of out at it, out at the his Luck Ranch and everything. Mm -hmm, he's just mm -hmm. done a lot of, a lot of fun stuff. And like you said, there's so many musicians there. I mean, yeah, yeah. well, I don't know if it's still that way now, but it was considered the music capital of the United States. You know, oh, maybe yeah, I, world, I, I know. music capital. I'm I'm just probably right because there's so much going on. Yeah, it's strange though, because there's no there's no business inter business structure of music here. There's 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 no record companies here. There's no this that, that that. But there's all these players, and it's just, and they're really good. So, but but boy, you want to find a record company? Well, there's a couple little ones. You want to find a music publishing company? You want to find a manager? You got to go to L.A. or Chicago or New York. It's just an odd situation. It's and there's a. a there's a lot of studios there too. I mean, yeah, tons. And, and a lot of the bands, like Del Castillo, for example, you know, for example, they they have their own studio down in Buda, Texas, and uh, yeah, yeah, and it's first class, you know. And yeah. there's a lot of a lot of the uh, a lot of studios. I don't know how they survive, and I I guess they do because a lot of the bands just want to perform their stuff and get exposure and try to get a record deal you know so well, yeah well the business model of a recording studio is you can't do that here because there's so many studios so a lot of people they'll just put their money into a small studio you know and just have enough and there's enough of them around here they're not very expensive and they're good you know i mean one of my friends has a studio he built well i've got mine here just a little it's good for about two people it's about it but i use it for my own stuff but my friend who lives over in Canyon Lake has this major studio. <coughs> it's just one room, but boy, is it good. And it's, woo, and he's not very expensive at all. So, you know, <coughs> some studios, you know, three, four, five hundred bucks an hour. Mm -mm. Have you heard of a, of a studio called Sonic Ranch? No, I haven't. Okay. Well, that's about 30 miles from my house, about 30 wow. minutes. 
and it is uh, out in the middle of a pecan orchard. It's owned by a guy named Tony Rancich, and it is considered the world's largest recording studio. Wow. He, ha he has eight recording rooms, and Ooh. one of them, late, the latest one's called the Blue Room that he's had, I think it's been up for a couple of years now, maybe a year or two. And, uh, and I went out there not too long ago uh, on, on a session with a group that had come in from Wisconsin. And a friend of mine, Terry Manning, who is a premier uh, musician, writer, engineer, uh, he's produced Led Zeppelin, ZZ Top, Shakira, on and on and wow. on. Wow. He worked at Stax Records in Memphis. But anyway, he uh, he lives about 30 minutes from us in the Upper Valley. <laughs> and he's uh, just a tremendous guy. And uh, and he's played my Border Legend shows several times. He brought in his his uh, group out of uh, from Memphis. Uh, just in, uh, r incredible musicians. I mean, these musicians are all like session players, you know. Yeah, just, yeah. You know, they just sit down and play it perfect for the first yep. time. You know, yeah. Yep. So, just makes you sick. You know, I so. really didn't know there was a, <laughs> there was that much of a, a music scene going on out in El Paso and in West Texas. That's amazing. Oh, there wow. are. In in fact, there's a there's a great studio right in El Paso um, called Star City. Little commercial for them. Uh, it's owned by Buddy and Pat Winston, and they have. Uh, uh, Buddy was the guitar, one of the guitar players in a band called PT and the Cruisers, and I managed that yeah. band. I managed them for about nine years or so. And um, anyway, uh, the PT, that's Patty Tiscareño is her name, great singer. Uh, in fact, her husband and I text each other back and forth on the Dallas football games every time, you know, boy, that was a lousy play or whatever. And we we're always commenting back and forth, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, it's, it's, a, a really neat band and buddy Winston has that group, um, uh, or that studio called star city. And it's a premier place. Really, wow. really, really great. Um, do the, do the PT Cruiser, cruisers go around, they play out a lot and they, they're going tours. No, they only play El Paso. Uh, they they're not even playing much now. They they do a lot of their stuff at the studio. In one of the one of the rooms in the studio will accommodate 125 people. And oh, that's, big, yeah, for a, a for a yeah, performance big, recording. Yeah, you know, sure. They do sure. video and audio there, and uh, it's all first class equipment. I mean, it's oh, it's that's wild. a beautiful board. I mean. Uh, really, really nice. I'll send you some pictures of the place. It's yeah, really, I'd love to see that. Really cool, and uh, remind me too, and I'll send you the one on the Sonic Ranch. Uh, okay, yeah, I will. Another great place, but I but don't anyway, know if, you, if you're aware of this, but do you know that Rupert Neve used to live in Wimberley? No, I didn't know that. Him. Yes, his company is here. All his stuff. You know, he passed away oh not too long ago, but a friend of mine bought the company from him. And they're making, Neve is just going crazy. They're making all kinds of stuff. And it's right here in Wimberley. So <laughs> and for those that don't know, Rupert Neve is one of the geniuses of, of recording, technically recording. His, his equipment is just, that's it. They're at the top of the line. There is no better. You know, and all the musicians know about Rupert Neve, you know. Oh, yeah. That's terrific. Yeah. Well, my friend, are there any other interesting stories or anecdotes or anything that you want to share before we wrap this up? Let's see. Uh, well, let's see a couple of things. Uh, the association has, there's three books out recently that in the last two years about, about the association. Uh, one, the first one was uh, uh, Cherish the Association by Malcolm C. Searles, who's English. And it was, it's it's and then the second one uh, is along comes the association that Russ Jaguer and Ashley Wren Collins wrote together, and then there's one that just came out called Rivals of the Beatles, which is this book about that thick, and uh, it's about all the '60s bands that we're in the middle of that one also. So there's there's those books out, and uh, Amazon I guess has every one of them. Uh, let's see, that's one thing I wanted to mention. Uh, <laughs> another little factoid, you know, the bands of nowadays, now, in the past 50 years, are so different than the bands of the previous 50 years, because uh, 
we've had in the association there have been 47 members during the, the life of the association you think well what's that about the thing is that's exactly what happened in the 30s and 40s and 50s people would come in the bands and they would leave They'd come in the bands and they would leave and a couple of the people in the bands would stay where the core members and that that happened to our bands so that was 47 people man i can't even name them all i don't know half of them wow and then uh our manager pat coleccio who was our longtime manager was probably one of the best and one of the worst managers in the entire music business you know he really looked at the band he was a football player and loved football and he managed the band like a um, uh, a sports team and it was really cool it was just really but but he didn't know anything about music <laughs> but he was a great guy he came to live with me and, and i lived in san marcus for a while and he, he was just tired of L.A. And I said, come on, live with us, you know, for a while. So he came on down there, fell in love with it. And he's this Italian, New Jersey Italian. You know what? Ah, I like that. Hey, that's like my friend yeah. Angelo Moriello. It's oh, a same Angelo thing. Moriello. Yeah. He, came, he came from New Jersey <laughs> also. That's where he was from. Oh, my God. Well, Pat fell in love with Texas, absolutely fell in love with it. Come to find out he was a natural horse rider. He's 83 years old, you know, riding horses and stuff. <laughs> so that was really funny. Uh, um, and uh, let's see, Pat, good Lord. He passed away a little while ago. Oh, that's about all I got. Well, my friend, this has okay. been an absolute blast. We've already gone an hour. I can't believe oh, it. Geez. You know, we really wow. zipped through this. And I, you know, but, uh, but this has been a lot of fun and yeah. I really look forward to staying in touch with you. Yes, and yes, definitely. when we get over to see the kids, uh, they've hang. been coming, they've been coming here, but when we get over to Austin, we'll definitely take a, a little side trip over to Wimberley and, and do uh, that. go drink a glass of wine or beer or something together. Yeah, you know? a good idea. Then we can run over to Royer's, you know, down the street and get some ice cream and pie, you know, whatever. <laughs> Sounds good. <laughs> and the next time we go out to a big bend, we'll come over to your place. Man. There you go. There you go. Come on over to El Paso, man. We'll yeah. take you for some real Mexican food, you know? Yeah, we got that here too. We got those, you know, those uh, South Texas guys, you know, the Conundo guys. That's right All right. Yeah. <laughs> Jules, this has been a real pleasure, my buddy. And we'll, uh, same, we'll same here. We'll talk to you real soon, okay? Okay, have a good day. Thank you. Thank you, my friend. We'll see you soon. Okay, bye. Bye.